Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. We're here at Dubai Watch Week 2019 with Stephen Forsey of Grubel Forsey. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Thank Absolute you. Pleasure. Thank you. I can't tell you how much I have lusted over the watches you make, even just parts of the watches you make. Mm. And I've got to know, how is it that you have 100 people making 100 watches a year? Because that's really an unprecedented ratio of employees to watches. Mm. How much energy goes into creating a normal Grubel 4C timepiece? Well, thank you, Tim. Yes, um, for Robert and myself as watchmakers, uh, the, the whole mission was to seek to revive and uh, transmit and practice hand finishing to kind of rediscover and uh, arrive at a historic level. So uh, at the very beginning, Robert and I set out uh, with that as an objective. Uh, we also wanted to uh, innovate in terms of the technical side, refusing the, um, the kind of conclusion that there was when, when we were students of watchmaking that everything had been invented. So um, we set out with that, um, <clears throat> with these kind of two pillars, I guess, as a, as a basis. And then from there, we were fortunate. Robert had a good experience in uh, terms of design creation. So he oversees that side, and I'm more on the technical side. So together, we, we set out um, to, uh, to bring a new generation of tourbillon. So we uh, discovered and worked and elaborated the inclined tourbillons, inclined escapements. And um, of course, that was, um, that was already a, a fairly, a fairly uh, considerable task. But then the, the hand finishing is really an element uh, where it's an average of four and a half months hours, uh, months of uh, man hours in um, each timepiece. And that means that uh, to build around 100, 110 watches, just the hand finishing requires a, a team of 20, 22 people in-house. So, you know, there was, a, there was a lot to do to build up that, uh, that expertise, to practice those skills. Um, and then when you combine that with uh, the aspect, we use uh, CNC and modern technologies for, for some aspects to make the raw parts. Um, then the hand finishing aspect, R&D of course, so when you put all that together, it's uh, an average, you know, it's pretty close, as you said yourself, to uh, one person, one uh, timepiece per year. So if you've ever wondered what the text on the side or the bottom of a Grubel 4C timepiece is all about, what he just said. That's it, yeah. I mean, these, um, you know, for, for Robert and myself, this, um, these are kind of our, this is our values. It's a mission statement, I suppose, to have that engraved relief uh, text uh, first, uh, we first used that on the Invention Piece 1 back in uh, 2007 and uh, there the idea was that uh, we, we knew that there were a lot of tourbillon or a certain number of tourbillon watches, historic ones, and yet very few were signed. You know, we don't know who the watchmakers were, uh, there's not much uh, trace and uh, information about them. So the idea of the Invention Piece 1 uh, with the text was to uh, actually you know, relate the history and the story of that, creating that timepiece. So that's a particularity of the Invention Piece series. Then uh, soon after that, the double tourbillon technique uh, was uh, a, a creation where, you know, we had a three-dimensional tourbillon. So we didn't want to uh, create a, a two-dimensional skeleton watch in that context. Very nice uh, technique and very traditional, but um, with that three-dimensional aspect, we wanted to be able to bring uh, a three-dimensional architecture. So the whole, uh, the whole aspect of the architecture of the movement being a, a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, pillar and a strong communication element in terms of opening up the world and the mysteries of mechanical watch movements. Now, you alluded to the fact that, in general, even the highest of the high-end watches do start with some level of electro spark erosion and CNC to create the rough parts mm. but you and Robert recently took that to the next level and completely reverted to what I'll call the 19th century yeah it's um, you know as you said yourself what's uh, you know what's fantastic about the uh, the watch the watchmaking world is that in the last 25 30 years we've been able to embrace the kind of technologies that uh, bring us uh, possibilities we didn't have before. 
You know, so literally creating inclined multiple axis tourbillons was something that was almost, perhaps it would have been unthinkable uh, before the advent of these technologies. So we can make very precise components uh, for, uh, for our timepieces and do things we, we had only perhaps dreamed of in the past. But then for Robert and myself, um, you know, the handmade uh, adventure goes back to the very beginnings of our, of our profession. And uh, so on my side, I was restoring antique watches, so I had to remake uh, parts for them. And uh, Robert was a prototypist, uh, also uh, making parts uh, in the handmade, you know, kind of hand uh, manufactured uh, techniques. So for us, this was uh, this was remained a very significant and important element. But um, over the years, you know, to to get Global Forcey going and to move forward and to be able to make enough pieces, we couldn't find uh, the skilled people we needed to make the parts by hand. So we embraced these uh, these more modern technologies. The creation of uh, the Timian Foundation, however was something which, uh, together with Philippe Dufour, Vianney Halter, you know, that uh, Robert and myself felt, uh, you know, for us this was really important to try to raise awareness about watchmaking as a skill and expertise, and uh, to uh, seek to, uh, you know, inventory and practice and transmit these skills for uh, new generations. We have to think about who's going to be able to service and restore time, you know, the, the different watches in the future. So that adventure led us uh, through with Naissance du Montre, uh, Michel Belanger, watchmaking school teacher from Paris. He uh, came on board to actually uh, inventory a good number of those base techniques to be able to uh, make uh, a watch using traditional techniques. But there were, two, there were two interesting elements that came back from that, which we didn't necessarily expect. One was that uh, on one side, the watch community and uh, a certain number of retail partners that we have around the world embraced the, the whole uh, story, the whole concept of Naissance du Montre and the foundation of Time Yen, and they were prepared to support it. So we, we realized that you know, the, the community had uh, you know, had progressed and, and were really understanding that there's a, a, critical, uh, a critical shortage of these skills and a, and a definite concern about losing that know-how. So that was, that was one interesting aspect. And the other one was that, uh, you know, Michel was from outside and he would come one week a month to uh, either to our workshop in La Chaudefant or up to the Vallée de Joux to Philippe Dufour to uh, gather and practice these techniques and move the project forward. But um, uh, Michel coming into, into the company and, and working with different people in our team uh, alighted a, a curiosity and an interest and we, we actually had a few people in our team who came forward and said I would like to I'd like to be able to do that you know I think I could do it and uh, so Robert uh, Robert and I with the team we thought well this could be a moment to try and uh, establish a, a landmark to try and get back to those techniques in some way so the the idea of the handmade uh, project was uh, was sketched out there and um, after that, well, you know, it's, there's a considerable amount of work because working to global force tolerances and criteria is obviously a certain challenge. What we did was, um, for the handmade project, we needed to define the criteria. So there are four fundamental criteria for establishing what we call a handmade watch. The first one being that any part of the uh, timepiece is going to be uh, made without CNC or modern technology. So the only assistance we can allow is an electric motor to, to drive a, a drill, a milling cutter, or actually turn the workpiece. Otherwise, everything else has to be done by hand. So that's the uh, first criteria. Second criteria we have in our collection is the hand finishing. So that's already, uh, you know, as I mentioned, four and a half months, man hours, per timepiece, and in the handmade, it's uh, no machine finishing. Third, uh, the third criteria is uh, that it should be built up by one watchmaker. While the handmade was uh, a team, we call it the sort of Global Force family in a way, of different people, because making these parts for the first time, uh, again by hand, 
uh, required, uh, you know, certain practice and people needed to, to uh, you know, to concentrate on one type of part, perhaps, or a couple. So that was a, an important uh, criteria. And the final one is what percentage of parts are we going to need? You know, what, where do we set the bar? So we set it at 90 percent. And in fact, uh, we, we have the handmade here. So the, it's easier actually to tell you what we didn't make by hand than what we did. 272 movement parts, 36 additional making up the whole uh, case in dial and environment. And uh, we didn't make by hand the mainspring, the jewels, the uh, spring bars for the bracelet, the sapphire crystals, and the case gaskets to make the water resistance. But otherwise, everything else is made using traditional handmade techniques. The screws being a kind of sort of obvious, semi-obvious uh, element. Um, and um, there's one uh, other part that I've left out the hairspring. And so uh, over the last uh, six, seven years uh, with Robert and the team, we've actually been able to, to bring together the expertise to make, uh, we can draw uh, 10 meters of hairspring wire to the right dimension. Then we can form it to the, to the coil, to the coil form, uh, treat it, and then uh, and really make our own hairspring in an artisanal way. So this has been a, a big challenge, but for us, it was, uh, it was very important to get into the, the heart of the movement, that balance wheel and uh, balance spring system. And for our audience at home, how many handmade watches will be made per year? Well, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a big project. The very first one here took uh, 6,000 man hours. So it's over three years of uh, man hours of work uh, to build this first one. But we, we hope we can make uh, perhaps two a year, maybe on a good year, maybe three. Uh, because you see, when you're making the parts, uh, it can all go wrong at any moment because you're no longer in that automated uh, process with the CNC machine. So it's really when you're, when you're the um, watchmaker or the uh, precision mechanic is making the part, any stage in the process, there can be an error, there can be a, a mistake, a lack of concentration. You know, the whole thing can go wrong. So it's a very, very uh, uh, intense uh, process. I like that you mentioned 6,000 man hours to create the first piece mm. because I recently read that Aston Martin Work Service reconstructed a 1950s, I want to say it was a DB3 racer, and the process involved fabricating an engine block, a yeah. full cylinder head, and then the entire aluminum body by mm. hand. Mm -hmm. And that project took 4,000 hours. Right, yeah. So yeah. the extraordinary <laughs> amount of energy that goes into the watch pretty much explains yeah, both its price and its scarcity. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. You see, for, for this type of project, so, you know, when you, when you started hand making, we had to aim for uh, kind of the number of, was, um, was like this. So we needed to aim for three complete uh, sets of parts to be relatively sure to get one finished movement. Because you know how it is, if you make just one, you've got a, a really big risk. If you make two, you, you reduce that risk. At three parts, you've got a fairly good risk that you're going to, a fairly good chance that you're going to be able to have uh, certainly one or maybe even two uh, parts which are going to be good through to the end. So it's, um, you know, it's about rediscovering these techniques. Making the balance wheel, we actually had a kind of 10 different trials along the, along the road to, to work it out because as you machine the metal out by hand, this, uh, this actually influences the form of the piece, it can, can distort, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different constraints which uh, suddenly uh, come to the surface. Now this watch is one of the more restrained Grubel 4 c designs. <laughs> and I've always, well, I spoke to a watchmaker who's famed for making, let's say, very simple watches the other day. Mm. And he sort of advanced from very complex grand et petite sonnerie watches mm. to, well, just basic three-hand watches. Right. And yeah. so it yeah. seems that with Grubel 4C, there has never been any aesthetic conservatism uh, and no dogmas, I should say, mm. about size or style. You've done a Fluxus tribute watch. You've done micro sculpture watches. Mm. You've created extraordinarily large watches with ceramic cases and sapphire bridges. What is the guiding philosophy for your company aesthetics? Because it seems like your only rule is that there are no rules. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, you see, 
Watchmaking is a very unique uh, craft. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique mixture of art, science and mechanics. And so when you, when you bring these different elements together, um, you know, the only constraints you have are the ones you impose yourself. So for Robert and myself, it's, uh, it's about uh, explaining the mechanism. You know, I mentioned the double tourbillon technique, as you said. Um, a recent uh, creation we've done is with the ceramic case and uh, sapphire bridges, a complete reconstruction of the, the whole structure and the whole architecture of the movement. Uh, so it's about, it's about sharing watchmaking, it's about uh, engaging, bringing the, the collector and the uh, watch, uh, you know, the watch community, those who, who love watches, um, you know, allow them the possibility to plunge into the mechanism. So while you, as you say, the, the handmade might appear fairly restrained, there's still a lot of architecture there um, and uh, a lot of uh, significant elements which actually make up the, the construction of the movement. Now I understand watchmakers always have a career arc. They generally start, they start small, learning basics. Mm. Eventually they get to hair springs. Once they move a little farther along, they might do restoration or make their own watch. Mm. And then ultimately, to make your own watch, you start another career arc. And as accomplished as you are, having started decades ago and spanned Audemars Piguet, Renoir Papi, Complotime, mm. Grubel Forcey, you've probably made just about everything you initially anticipated you'd want to make. Are there any unrequited dreams or future goals that still well, drive you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely, you know, I mean, um, for Robert and myself with the team, we, we've still got uh, at least 10 years of, uh, of, of ideas rolled out, which are, which are laid out there, which uh, we want to work with. Um, recent uh, developments, you know, the, actually Global Force is like a, it's like a huge research and development project. So from the very beginning, with our approach with the inclined double tour beyond 30 degrees, it was uh, all about relearning and rebuilding the know-how which had been lost through the electronic watch crisis of the 70s and 80s. So we needed to have a laboratory in-house, which we have today. Six people full-time are just building the prototypes and uh, evaluating and qualifying the, you know, the, the different uh, mechanisms we make. But we've uh, more recently uh, talked about uh, mechanical nano. So this is about going back to the very fundamentals of uh, watchmaking where, you know, we have two constraints. So we have one is space and the other is the energy and how we use that energy. So uh, looking at that, uh, mechanical nano has enabled us to, to really go into, into detail and to think about energy on a nano joules uh, scale in terms of that and how to use that energy as best we can and to, to be able to push forward. So, you know, there the only limitations we have, as I said earlier, um, are the ones we impose ourselves. So once you, once you recognize that you can break down those barriers, you can really move forward and, uh, and come to new, uh, new exciting uh, constructions, new uh, mechanisms. This is one of the great things about uh, watchmaking today. I think that uh, new technologies have brought uh, additional avenues to what we could do, and uh, the creativity has opened up, so, so we're able to actually imagine and uh, realize things which we, we didn't think were possible before. Okay, and I have one more question for those who are new to your brand, curious, maybe dating, haven't married yet. What is the single essential Grubel 4C watch that people need to understand to understand you and Robert? <laughs> That's that's really a difficult one, you know. I mean, um, Robert and I, uh, you know, we launched Rebel Force in 2004, and since then we've developed 25 calibers. So there is there is a wide palette. What's interesting is when you look across the the portfolio of the collection, is that they they all belong to uh, the Rebel Force family. It's all a continuation and expansion of the same uh, founding uh, spirit. So, I mean, in one side, the, the very first double tourbillon 30 degrees is a, a significant milestone piece because it, it laid the foundation stones for, for what we've been working on and building the team and the whole adventure with our collectors since then. Um, but as much as that, there's a couple of, there's a few iconic pieces. I mean, the, the asymmetric case uh, stands out as a, you know, as a, as a, particular, uh, a particular signature of Global Forcing. And yet, the, perhaps the, one of the most iconic and easily recognizable pieces is going to be the GMT with an oversized, large, rotating globe inside the movement uh, showing us terrestrial time, 
day and night indication. So that's, uh, that's really a, a piece which um, I think is, uh, you know, collectors, as soon as they see that, that's, that's kind of a, uh, it's going to be a target. Definitely. It's in the pantheon, so to speak. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. From the man himself, Stephen Forsey of Grubel Forsey. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tim. Super. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.